how it all ends, we're in part two. How does Jesus want to impact our lives? That's what the book of Revelation is about. When you read this and see how he's dressed, did you notice that? Have you started reading and seeing he's wearing this long robe and the sash around the middle? Why is all that in there? Why, why does God spend so much time telling us all these things that are so far from what, what our reality is? Because, as we're going to see today, the first law of textual interpretation, the first, in theology it's called the first canon of textual interpretation is, that the primary meaning of any portion of scripture is what God intended to communicate to the group that received his first, you know, who he directed that first letter to or epistle or whoever. So these people were seeing this picture of Jesus and it answered the question, how does he want to impact our lives? So with that, let's pray, you ready? Father, uh, apart from you, you've told us we can do nothing. We do a lot, but it amounts to nothing. And so we ask for this class to touch each of our lives, mine and all of these precious students, not by might, not by power, not by interesting pictures, but by your spirit, says the Lord. That's what we ask for, for the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen. How does God want to impact our lives? He wants us to learn how to live in an ever-darkening world. The people that this letter came to, the people that were in the second generation church were living in a time that was not quite paralleled until modern times. They lived in the most civilized, highly, highly technological world. Did you know a lot of things that were built back then are still operating today? There are aqueducts the Romans built that are still funneling water 2,000 years later. Some of them are five and 600 miles long. The technology of that world has been unrivaled until modern times. So they lived in a, you think you're technological? They were really on the cusp, the cutting edge of technology. But Jesus was interested in seeing whether they were applying in their lives, their daily lives, what he'd left, the Gospels and the Epistles. Now, how do we understand and interpret the Bible? I know you have a whole class on that, I, probably Mark Strout, who knows, Paul Weaver, I don't know who teaches it, but how do you understand hermeneutics, not homiletics, trans, you know, communicating, but hermeneutics, how do you understand the Bible? Well, here's the simple course. Correct interpretation of any part of the Bible, my part that they've assigned me to, or all the others, is based on the historic, geographic, and the scriptural context. And when you combine that with the actual grammar, all the, the exact words and the tenses and everything else, you have proper interpretation. But you say, wait a minute. Did all of them have to do that? Did they have to get a Greek lexicon and all that? No, see, that's the problem. They were hearing it directly targeted for where they were. We need all that so that we can understand what that message was, and how do we put it? Well, the first rule, and I already said this, of textual interpretation is what did God mean when he spoke to the original recipients? So to understand the book of Revelation, the, more, the danger is to say, well, to me this means. Now, I've led enough Bible studies, I go, oh, that's, that's like running your fingers on blackboards. You probably don't even know what that expression is. It used to be in the old days, they had these hard, boards and they wrote with chalk and and if you did something wrong it was like running your fingernails down that and it made this horrible noise and and it was screechy that's what it's like when someone says well to me the bible means this because it doesn't really matter what it means to me it matters what it meant to god the message he wanted to communicate now how it applies to me is vital what it means, there's actually only one true biblical interpretation of any passage of the scripture. Did you know that? There aren't 20. There aren't, well, there are seven different interpretations. No, there are seven views. God did not mean seven different things. Did you know that? And the lifelong goal for all of us is to understand the totality of the scripture. There's a word called analogia scriptura, which is part of the Reformation, which means that the scriptures interpret the scriptures. And the more that you understand the whole, 
the more you'll understand any individual part. Although, do you remember what Peter said about Paul? You all remember that, right? I think, doesn't Don Locke teach 1st, 2nd Peter or something? But when he covered that, do you remember what Peter says about Paul? Peter says, Paul writes many things that are very hard to understand. Peter said that about Paul? Yeah. You see, it's, it's not just us that, that are spending our lives trying to understand the Bible. They were trying to understand. But what did God mean when he spoke to the original recipients? Who are the original recipients? Right there they are. I mean, they're those seven churches that represented all the churches, but they were seven literal geographic locations. Historic, in fact, Bonnie and I, we've led groups to, you know, like many other people, to all those places. And when you walk around them, you see that there were real people living in real places that had real problems. And Jesus addresses local problems and applied his truth to their lives. So let's do that. Back to my journal, okay, and I typed it out for you. Here's my 15th finding, and we're only in verse 9. And I wrote this. I read verse 9, so here's how I do it. I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation and kingdom, and I looked up tribulation, slipsis. That's an interesting word. Slipsis is the the big overview word for tribulation. Do you know what it means? To be squashed. Think trash compactor. Think of the, the garbage truck, how, how the little garbage is put in the back and then it goes, and it squeezes and you know where we live, I don't know if it's around here, but all the water and stuff comes out of the truck and leaks out, you know, all that smelly water as they're squeezing all that garbage, you know, it's terrible. That's the word, verse nine. In the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I, John, was on the island that is called Patmos. So he's, he's telling us who he is. He is their brother in Christ. He's, he's also suffering like them. He's on the island that is called Patmos. Why is he there? For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what I wrote is, John was at the worst time of his life. Now that's, that's the observation I made. The Apostle John had endured the horrors of the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember how many times he'd walked to Jerusalem with Jesus? Jesus went every year at least at Passover, maybe more. John had gone up with him every time and they would go up to Jerusalem and they'd see it. John had lived through the the horrors of the destruction of Jerusalem. Doesn't mean he was there because he wouldn't have survived probably, but he lived through it because he heard about it and maybe from a distance saw it. He heard about the massacre of a million fellow Jews. He heard about the systematic hunting down of all of his fellow apostles by the Roman Empire. And now look, the very personal adversary of John was the emperor himself, Domitian. Domitian, who's Domitian? Well, his dad Vespasian is the one that started the Jewish wars. His brother Titus is the one that finished the Jewish wars and destroyed Jerusalem, murdered all the Jews, the 1.1 million, did the the siege of Masada and then wrapped it up in Galilee and and wiped out the rest of them. But now the dad and the brother had both reigned, but now Domitian, the younger son, comes to power. By the way, Domitian is an amazing guy. And if I had time, I would show you. I mean, Bonnie and I were teaching Romans and Galatians in the city of Rome. How would you like that? That's what we did in October. I taught the book of Romans and the book of Galatians in the city of Rome. I mean, what a blessing. And I mean, I would take the students on field trips and we'd go to the Vatican to talk about Romanism. You know, we went to, you know, to the Santa Scala or Scala Santa it's called, where Luther came to know the gospel as he was crawling up those steps. And we did all that, it was really fun. But you know, the most moving thing that got my attention was going up on the, the Palatine Hill the entire hilltop became Domitian's palace. It is so big, it was at least three stories high. Each story was as tall as this. How would you like to live inside of a palace that had ceilings this high? It's unbelievably vaulted stuff. There are fountains, there are everything. Domitian 
exuded the power of Rome. He, he just was kind of like, well, he thought he was a god, and he made them worship him. And that guy that built the whole, all the other Caesars lived in his house. They would change it a little bit. But he took Augustus Caesar's little house and made it into his massive one that no one really ever made bigger. He was the top of the Palatine builders. But John is hunted down by Domitian, he's captured by Domitian, he's exiled by Domitian, and John is left far from anyone that he ever loved, that he ever served, that he ever taught, and he is a prisoner of the empire, and he's far away from everyone except for one. And so John's at the worst time of his life, and his best friend shows up. Isn't that neat? See, that's, that's what you see in this book. Jesus knew right where he was. Remember, Jesus is good and knows everything and all-powerful, and he's always with us. But maybe John needed to remind, be reminded that Jesus was with him, so he showed himself to him, and he saw him. The next thing I found was number 16. We can stay full of the Holy Spirit even though it's the worst of times. John was at the worst time of his life. And look what it says in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Let's see, this is Tuesday. Were you in the Spirit on the Lord's Day on Sunday? Is that how you described yourself on Sunday? Did you really endeavor to be in the Spirit on Sunday? Do you ever think about being in the Spirit on Sunday? You're not even being hunted down. I think most of us in this room are not being hunted down. I don't think you're going to be exiled. I'm not probably going to be exiled anytime soon. We have such comfortable lives compared to what John was going through. But John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Here it is again, Sunday. And wherever John finds himself, that is always the Lord's Day. Did the Romans look on Sunday as the Lord's Day? Are you kidding? Domitian was the Lord, and every day was his day. And John was saying, I'm calibrating not with my problems and with all my struggles, but I'm calibrating with God. And God said that this first day of the week, I would devote to him. So even though I'm a prisoner on this island and whatever, he was in forced labor, who knows what they were doing to him. He said, even though I'm a prisoner and I can't go to the gathering of the body, I'm in the Spirit. And I'm joining with all the other believers on earth, and I'm joining with all the believers already in heaven, and I'm in the Spirit worshiping God. Is that what you did on Sunday? See, that's what the Lord wants. Anywhere we are. John is in the Spirit. That's the key to serving God in the end of days. We have to stay full of the Spirit. We have to walk through life in Christ. And we can live in the Spirit no matter what we're going through. That's why I love to read great biographies and see how they did it. Uh, you know, whether it's Jim Elliott with the Akas, you know what I mean. It doesn't matter which person you read. Uh, look at his widow, Elizabeth Elliott, and how she served the Lord. I mean, it's how do these great servants of the Lord do it? Applying the Scriptures. Well, Back to verse 9. John was a prisoner of the empire. So I, not only was he having a bad time, he was a prisoner of the empire. He was on that island. It's off the coast of Turkey. It's called Roman Asia Minor Province. It, the island, I mean, when we take groups there, it's just 10 miles long. At the widest, it's only 6 miles wide. Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96, sent him there. And according to Eusebius, you say, who's Eusebius? I mean, he's the father of church history. He's the bishop of Caesarea, as in where Paul sailed in and out of on the coast of Israel. He was the pastor there, and he wrote the first church history. And he said that Nerva, the one who followed Domitian, released John and all the other you know, prisoners that uh, Domitian, the Christians that Domitian had imprisoned. Number 18, John shared the same struggles as the faithful saints in the seven churches. Uh, remember, I already read it, your verse 9, your companion in the tribulation, the kingdom, and the patience. What John's saying is, even though I'm far away, remember, he pastored the church at Ephesus. The church, remember, where Paul was for three years and where he in, in kind of installed Timothy. That's where the pastoral epistles go to, Timothy pastoring in Ephesus which Eusebius said was the largest church of the ancient world. 
But John had been there. Can you imagine going to church when John was a pastor and Mary attended, Paul was from there, John was there. I mean, what a church to go to. And John says, I'm going through the same struggles as you. And he says, we're all together awaiting Christ's return to right all wrongs, patiently and enduring through these hard times. There's where Patmos is. On my little map I've showed you, you see Crete, that's the island under the red arrow, and then the red arrow is pointing right there. That little tiny island off the, the western shore of Turkey. But as John was there, Jesus had sent revelation knowing that there were centuries of godless, immoral emperors who had absolute and ruthless power. Centuries of them ahead for the church. Now here, there's this interesting group and they've taken all of the statues and everything else they can find and they've put them into machine learning, you know, AI, and they've tried to see what these guys look like. And these, this is their most recent posting of what, if you'd have met one of these emperors, what they would have looked like. God knew that Julius Caesar and Augustus and Tiberius and Caligula and Claudius and Nero and Galba and Otho and Vitellius, and there's Vespasian, the father of Titus and Domitian, and Nerva who followed him, and Trajan, oh, he was a real persecutor of the church. God knew. And that's why Revelation was sent to guide believers through hard times. Now, you don't have to be in Rome to have a hard time. You can have a hard time in New York. You can have a hard time anywhere. But look, when John uses that word in verse 9, patience, he's using the word for, uh, for God telling us how to hold on to Christ. Patience means you hold on even when it hurts. It's kind of like in the movies where they're clinging, you know, and they make, you know, and they're holding on. They're holding on even though it hurts. So that's, that's the vivid imagery. John's readers were going through the exact same thing. They were meeting in secret to avoid being fed to lions. They were suffering for their faith. And listen, they were constantly surrounded with so much immorality that they faced temptation walking down the street. Have you ever gone to a museum and seen any Greek statues, hardly any of them have any clothes on. And people go, hmm, you know. Why? That was the Greek ideal. Athletics were practiced in gymnasium. You ever heard of a gymnasium? Do we have a gymnasium here? You have one, but it's not a real one. Because gymnas is the Greek word for naked. It's a place where naked people practiced they're sports. And every town of any size had the gymnasium. And you didn't have to beep your card to get into it. It just was part of life. And they had the bathhouse and they had everything. And all those statues you see is what they saw in real life. Now look, they were constantly surrounded with so much immorality that they faced temptation just walking down the street. Now it was unlike that in any time in history until 2007 when Steve Jobs, the genius, the, the man who will probably be recorded in history as, as altering the direction of human society, invented this to be in everyone's pocket. Actually, he invented the music first to be in our pocket. And then he thought, well, I'll put the music with the phone, and then I'll add a camera, and then I'll add a flashlight, and then I'll add everything else you need to live. So that young people get to the point where they sleep with this because they don't want to miss anything. And you know what? In the Roman world, just walking through life, you faced endless temptations. That it wasn't like that in the rest of history until our day. Did you know it used to be, if you wanted to be tempted, you had to go on a journey to wherever the temptation was. And most people didn't live near a lot of temptations. They just worked all the time. But now, the temptation is in the pocket. Did you know, what is it, 80, 89% of all pornography is consumed on portable devices, where you can be all alone and know who's watching and not except for one who's always with us. See, I get asked all the time as I travel to visit with young people, they say, how, how do we overcome our struggle with whatever tempts us? 
I said, by understanding the attributes of God. Joseph did, didn't he? Remember Joseph in Genesis? Joseph is attacked by Potiphar's wife. She starts pulling his clothes off. That's the direct approach. Pull the clothes off. And he stops her. He says, stop! She says, why? He said, how can I do this evil and sin against God? And you know what Potiphar's wife did? She went like this. She said, there's nobody else in this room. Joseph said, yes, there is. My God is here, and I will not sin against him. That's the answer to how we overcome temptation, knowing that the God who loves us, who knows everything, who has all power, is not far away. He's right here. And that's what he reminded John of, and John reminded the church. Well, real quickly, I think we have enough time. I'll listen to a little bit of this. This, Bonnie and I, uh, one of the privileges of our lives is to teach the Bible all over the place. Uh, and, and one of the places that we taught was on the Isle of Patmos more than once. And so finally, I decided I would take my uh, cell phone and just quick pop a video. So I hope the sound comes through. Uh, here's a video overviewing Revelation for you. God thinks someone needs when they're struggling and alone and in danger? Well, the book of Revelation was written to someone just like that. The Apostle John was on a rocky, barren island called Patmos on the Aegean Sea. That's exactly where we are right now, on a rocky, barren, seaside island on the Aegean Sea. And John remembered the loss of all of his beloved brothers in ministry. The apostles had each been hunted down and martyred by the empire. He was the last one, and they got him, and they put him here in exile. But as the years went by, he began to remember. He remembered his beloved city was gone, destroyed, leveled. The hundreds of thousands of fellow Jews massacred or sold into slavery. And now here he was, old, weak, alone, and in danger. So what does God think you need when the empire is against you and hunting you down and when the world seems to be headed toward destruction? Well, it sounds kind of like the times we live in. If you're listening to the news at all about global warming and water scarcity and the environment being destroyed by humanities, uh, industries, and CO emissions. It, it's true. The earth is shaking and groaning and dying, just like it says in God's Word. And so what's the, the most encouraging thing that God could send? Well, to the Apostle John, it was this book of Revelation. And he said, you're blessed if you read it, and you're blessed if you heed it, and you're blessed if you keep the things that are written in it. And that's what this course is about is all about. That is moving to me to think that John was all alone and Jesus said, you're not. I'm here. I know what you're going through and it's part of my plan. So Jesus sends, what's, what's the plan? Well, look at verse 11. He looked around Behind him, he hears this voice of the trumpet, and he hears behind him, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, verse 11, what you see right in a book. And verse 12, he turns around to see Jesus. Now look what I wrote. This is the only picture of Jesus in the Bible. Have you ever thought about that? This is the only picture of Jesus. Now Isaiah says that his form you know, is worse, his face is, is so battered, he doesn't look like he's a human. And it says his beard was pulled out, but it doesn't tell us what he looked like, just how bad he looked. This is the only picture of Jesus in the whole Bible. And look what it is. It's, it's the only word picture describing God the Son, Jesus Christ. It has seven elements, remember? Why not? Seven. John loves sevens. It's Jesus' hair, his eyes, his feet, his voice, his hands, his mouth, and his face. And what the purpose of this passage is, is something we need. Peter put it this way. He said, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. That's why he wrote his epistles. Peter didn't write a lot of new stuff. He just reminded them. John didn't write in this book new stuff. He just reminded 
Jesus reminds them of what? Well, this is the amazing picture we need to ponder each day as we live through the last days. Jesus came to Patmos to remind John and us that the Christ of the Gospels is now unleashed. Do you understand what is going on? Think about three years that John, see, John often went back to those days in Galilee, those days walking. I mean, could you imagine how fun it was to relive those days? What were those days like? Well, wherever Jesus went, and John had followed him for three plus years, Christ's very presence made sure that death fled. I mean, Jesus was raising people from the dead. He, all he had to do is stop when the widow's son of Nain was in that coffin. He just touched the coffin and the guy sat up. That must have been very unsettling to the people. You know, I mean, it was unbelievable. Diseases faded, and the despair of the multitudes melted because broken bodies that could just come into contact with Jesus were mended. You ever thought about that? People used to line the way through the marketplace where Jesus was coming, and if Jesus just walked by, if he was in their presence, it just was like this power emanated from him, if you could just get people close to him. So they were digging through roofs, you know. They were climbing trees to get sight of him. Whatever they could do, they were reaching through. Remember the woman in, in Mark chapter 5? She reaches through the crowd, through all the feet, and grabs a tassel of Jesus' robe. If you could just get near him, ruined lives were repaired, sightless eyes were restored, Empty ears were filled with sound, missing fingers were returned, hungering lives were satisfied. And John remembered that everywhere Jesus went, wherever he was, whenever he was there, the presence of Jesus meant death, disease, despair were no more. So you remembered that. But Jesus only did that for being in one place at a time. Most of the Gospels are crowds of people walking around saying, which, which way did he go now? Where? And they were, they'd sail across the Sea of Galilee because they thought he was on the other side and they were going back and forth because just one place at a time. Crowds came to him, multitudes flocked to him, none were disappointed. If he came to him, he helped them all. Sometimes it was so great that they would take extreme measures, but they did whatever to get near him. But now after Resurrection Sunday, this is what Jesus was reminding John and us about. The unlimited power of Christ is now available everywhere. Think about that. Something had changed. After resurrection morning, Jesus was now available to anyone anywhere and any time. If you read those 40 days he was on earth before the ascension, Jesus was showing up all over the place. He showed up walking on a road with a couple on their way to Emmaus, and all of a sudden he's walking through the door with the disciples scared to death inside. And then he's showing up when Thomas finally shows up to restore him. Jesus is, all, and then he goes up and he's on a mountain in Galilee. He's just everywhere and anywhere with anyone. Now, for a moment, Let's back up. We've gotten so far, we need to go back to verse 5. I want to show you something in verse 5. Because I want you to think about what was the greatest miracle that Jesus accomplished? Was it raising people from the dead? Well, it was a great miracle, but almost all of them, in fact, all of them, died again, right? All of them. He healed them from death, but they died again. How about the people he fixed their eyes? Well, if they live long enough, what happened? They didn't have glasses back then. They lost their sight. What about the people he gave their hearing back? If they lived long enough, that started wearing out. What about the people? Do you understand what I mean? All of Jesus' miracles, from the feeding of the 5,000 to the calming of the storm to raising the dead to fixing all the diseases in the eyes and the ears, all after a period of time wore out. The wine changed from water was gone. The food of the feeding of the four and 5,000 was gone. What's the only miracle of Jesus that never went away? It's right there. It's verse five. Our greatest need isn't happiness or health or, or food. It's forgiveness. And that's the one miracle Jesus is still doing today. Verse five. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, him who loves us, 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The miracle that's still going on today, now I'm not saying Jesus doesn't heal people. There aren't healers, but he still heals people. I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't perform miracles because we're supposed to call unto him and he shows us great and mighty things we, we don't know. But he's not doing what he did during his earthly ministry, walking by and everybody that gets near him gets well. But you know what he's still doing? The greatest miracle. I think we need to think about that. Sometimes I don't think about that. I was actually working on this material. I was editing. Uh, this class is from a book I wrote called Living Hope for the End of Days. It was my dissertation at Dallas Seminary. So I was editing that book into lessons, daily devotionals, and I was a pastor and I would go every day to Starbucks because if you stay in the church, people just come and I had a policy. If anybody came, no matter who it was, I would meet with them because the purpose is to minister to the flock. And so I would go on my lunch hour and not eat at the church and I would go and, and just have a glass of vitamin C. Do you know what that is? They sell it at Starbucks, coffee. And so I would go have my vitamin C uh, and, and sit there and I found this little corner in Starbucks in this downtown one that was uber busy. I mean, no, they didn't have Uber, it was busy. And the line always went, you know, there was a turnstile and it went out the door. It was the busiest Starbucks in that town of a million people. And I would, you know, get my, I would stand in line and I'd read and I'd get my drink and I'd go over to my corner table and I'd sit there and I'd spend my hour editing. The problem is getting my drink. Every day when I would get my drink, this barista would slide it across and look at me. And I would look at him. And I noticed a lot of things about him right away. One thing was he looked like um, Eminem used to look. Black, you know, the black ski cap thing close to his head. Black everything. I guess it was called goth or something back then. Everything was black. But it wasn't just black. He had metal everywhere. He wore big, like, log chains when he walked behind the Starbucks counter. I didn't know they let people dress like that at Starbucks. Such so had to wear the green apron, but maybe it was good. Clink, 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 his chains. Then I, he had studs, metal studs. They looked like alligators, you know, teeth or something, all the way down his pants. He had so many piercings. His tongue was like, it looked like a pin cushion, you know, and, and he, everything about him was pierced, metal, chains, black. Great. I mean, that was him. I was studying Revelation, you know. He's the barista. Every day, five days a week. Finally, one day, I looked at him and I looked right into his eyes. His eyes were this, the whites of his eyes were this color. Actually, they were orange. Do any of you medical, you know what that is? It's called hyperbilirubinemia. That meant that his liver was no longer pulling the poisons out of his body and they were building up in his body and the first place it shows is in the whites of your eyes. You can always tell a heavy duty drug user that's really ODing like the Foo Fighter guy. If someone would have looked at his, you know, the one that overdosed last month, the drummer, he would have had probably orange in his eyes because his body wasn't able to keep up with the poisons from all those chemicals. So here I am confronted with the fact, I am studying the book of Revelation to teach to people and I'm being slid a, a Starbucks by a guy when he looks at me, I can tell he's dying before my very eyes. Well, I have a policy. I won't witness to anybody on company time because it's like stealing from their, their employer, you know? And so, like, I'll give a, you know, a track to a waitress, but you don't engage her in this 20-minute talk because someone's going to get upset. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm editing today, but I want to talk to that barista. And so if, when I get up to the counter and order, there's no one behind me, I'll keep my 
my principle that I won't steal from the Starbucks by witnessing to their employees on work time. And so if no one's behind me, I'll witness to this guy. So I decided that, that I would look at his name tag. So the next day he went like this, looked at me with his orange eyes, Daniel. So I was ready. So I got my track, my gospel track that I always keep in my wallet, and I pulled it out. I wrote my name and, you know, my email address on it, and I got it all ready, and I got over to Starbucks, city of one million that has a turnstile, and they're out the door. And I got in line, it was out the door, and I was reading and everything, and I kept reading, and I kept reading, and I kept reading, and I got up to the counter, and I made my order, and I went, there was no one behind me. It was most, I'd never been at Starbucks with no one behind me. I thought, wow, why don't I pray for more things? You know, that's really great. So I got down there and I thought, oh, now, and then they started coming in. I don't know whether you know, there had been a light or whatever, but people started coming in. So I knew I only had a short time. And so I ordered my same thing and I got down there and I waited and he went across and I thought, how do you share the gospel in a very short time? So I looked at him, I said, hi, Daniel. And he went, his orange eyes got wider you know my name? I said, yeah, Daniel, I've been here every day for like a month. I said, and Daniel, you know what? I saw your eyes. I said, Daniel, you're going to wake up one of these days in hell. I said, if you keep going the direction you're going, I said, you're going to hell. And I pulled out my gospel track and I said, and this is a Bible study that tells you how you can know Jesus Christ who's still performing the miracle of forgiving and it'll set you free. Well, how long did that take? 27 seconds, handed him the track, went off to my little table, edited another chapter, couldn't wait. And by the way, I wrote down Daniel in my prayer guide and my little thing in my Bible where I pray for people. I prayed, 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 and said, Lord, I can't wait. I'm going to follow up tomorrow. You can let the people be in line. I'll follow up without any miracles, you know. And I got, and I ordered, and I went. And I said to the cashier, where's Daniel? She said, all of us are asking that. She said, where's Daniel? She says, we're all asking that. She said, did you know yesterday at 2 o'clock, he walked out the back door of the building and he's never come back. I said, oh. Next day, where's Daniel? She said, no one's seen him since two days ago. A whole week, where's Daniel? And then I really felt bad. I thought, he probably died. You know, he's behind the dumpster. I actually walked, you know, I walked around to see if, you know, Daniel had collapsed by the dumpster when he was taking out all the cups everyone uses. I prayed for him, and then I kind of forgot about him. And basically, um, about a year later, I was editing another book, and I was sitting in my corner, totally immersed, and all of a sudden I noticed out of my peripheral vision, someone was kind of edging up to my table, and I, my eyes, I didn't look at them, but I saw black, black, metal, chains, and I looked up, and the biggest smile you've ever seen, nothing else had changed. I mean, he had every metal and chain and his m M&M and hat and everything else, but he had a radiant, huge smile and big white eyes, and he looked at me and he said, Man, I've been looking all over for you. He says, hey, you scared the hell out of me. And he just went on and on. And I said, what? He said, you, you slid that paper to me and told me I was going to hell and scared me to death, but you didn't explain it to me. So he said, I walked right out the back door. And he said, I started walking down the street with your paper saying, have you ever seen one of these? Could you explain this to me? Could you explain this to me? Could you explain this to me? And he said, I walked for about two hours until I came to a storefront church. It was called Guts. And everybody there looked like him. I mean, they were bodybuilders and heavy metal, everything, you know. And it was a real church. And they explained the gospel, led him to Christ, invited him to be, he was a, a drummer in a heavy metal band, invited him to drum for them. And he says, I'm on tour now. He says, I do Christian shows all the time. And he says, every time in the show, they stop the show with all the steam and the lights and everything. And he said, I walk out to the front and I said, I want to tell you about the time that someone scared the hell out of me and, and gave me a track. And he gives his testimony. And I thought, wow. We never know the power of God unto salvation until we share it with people. I hope that you'll see God's greatest miracle every time we follow his prompting to share the gospel. Well, the 20th thing I found is, what does the picture of Jesus reveal to us? Starting verse 11, 
Jesus' hair is white. It speaks of him being the Ancient of Days. That's tying back to Daniel. His eyes, like flames of fire. Again, it's, it's talking about this laser-like look of Christ inspecting our lives. He's omniscient. His feet are like brass. And he's the ultimate judge. And it speaks of his justice and righteousness, his voice. It says it was like the sound of many waters. And I think about those waves and the storms hitting Patmos. And John thought about that. And it's a voice we should listen to. And his hands. Remember, John says he's holding the stars. He's, he's holding those messengers of the churches. His, it speaks of his, his compassion. And remember how many times Jesus touched people in the gospel. He's always reaching out and touching people. John thought of those hands and, and his mouth. John remembered how Jesus said in John 5 that the day is coming which all in the graves will hear my voice and are going to come out of the graves. I mean, what a voice he has. And then his face. John saw him. His face was like the sun. You know what he says in verse 11? Jesus said, what you see in the middle of verse 11, write in a book and send to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what I wrote is, Jesus speaks to us today. He had a message for the believers of all time. Those seven represented all the believers of the New Testament world. The seven meant a collection of all the churches, but also because it's in Revelation, it spoke of the churches throughout all ages. It's to us. Jesus has a message for us. And what I see is in verse 12. Look at this. And I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In verse 13, in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one was like the son of man. He had a garment down to the feet. Remember I told you, why is he dressed like that? He was girded about the chest with a golden band. And then I've already read, his hair was white like wool. Jesus is now, I wrote, walking around among his churches. That's what he's walking around. That's why it says in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the, the, the messengers or the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Jesus said, I'm walking around holding the messengers, visiting the churches. So I wrote in my journal, Jesus now walks around among his churches looking at their lives and ministry. He's seeking how he might help us best reflect him as his lights in the world. Did you know this is Jesus' favorite word for himself? When Jesus identified himself, what did he call himself? Most often, the Son of Man. So he was like the Son of Man. And when John received revelation, he was in exile. He was cut off. Paul had gone to Rome and was beheaded. Peter, his childhood friend, was gone. His own brother James was arrested. And every other apostle was hunted down. And John was the target. And so he turned to see the voice. And one like the Son of Man. You know what Jesus most often recorded emotion is in the, in the Gospels? The four Gospels, the 89 chapters. What is Jesus most often shown to be? Compassionate. Do you know what the word compassion means? It's the word splank noi. And it means to be moved right here viscerally. You feel it. Jesus is the compassionate one. He feels our fears, our weaknesses, our pains. In fact, Hebrews 2 says that he destroyed him that had the power of death so that he could deliver us who through fear of death all of our life were subject to bondage. And then it says in chapter 4 that he is the, the, the one we can come to, the throne of grace and mercy in our time of need. Jesus is compassionate. He was tempted in all points, so he feels our struggles. He wants to help us in every time of need. So this is what I... I wrote down, see my journal, I really enjoy that time alone, thinking through the scripture, looking for what God wants me to learn that day. And I wrote, Jesus knew right where John was. He knew where every member of the seven churches were, not just physically, but he knew where they were spiritually. He knew that. And Jesus reveals that he will help each of us through life. How do I know that? Because the outfit he's wearing is the outfit of the priest, the high priest actually. That's why I had that, that kind of uh, girdle around the middle here, the sash. And, and it was a picture that he is the one that's coming to help us. No matter where we are now in the spectrum of obedience, Jesus has a plan to get us back on target. 
and to keep us there. Now, I told you I'd show you an uh, application prayer. So after I got all done with all these things, every day I write one of these. So this is the one I wrote this day. Lord, I want to know and follow your plan. Help me to read, hear, and hear what you're saying and keep what you want me to keep. You love me and loose me and wash me. You are the Almighty. Sunday is your day. And as you walk around your church, may you find me healthy. Use the sword of your word in my life to keep me useful and pure. For Jesus' sake, amen. And so the whole book of Revelation is about how it all ends. But that's not the whole book of Revelation. The purpose for us, besides knowing how it all ends, is to know how Jesus wants to impact our lives. 